till it says that we are live. All right, in theory, we're live. So, hey everyone, welcome to uh, Open Space. Of course, this is my uh, Monday uh, live interactive interview, uh, sometimes solo, sometimes with a special guest. And this week, I've got one of my special guests. Uh, one of the people I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, uh, Rob Hoyt from Tethers Unlimited. Rob, welcome to Open Space. Thanks for having me here. Glad to talk to you. Uh, so for people who don't know what Tethers Unlimited are, and, and I, I can't imagine that's possible because I feel like I've featured some of your projects, although there's a new one now that I want to get into shortly, so that'll come next. Uh, so what do you guys do? Overall, we develop and sell uh, advanced space technologies. We're called Tethers Unlimited because when we first started out, we were very focused on space tether technologies for applications like end-of-life deorbit of spacecraft and orbital maneuvering of spacecraft. And we still work on tethers when we can, but over the past uh, 12 or 15 years, we branched out into a couple related areas. So right now, about half of our work is uh, providing high-performance components for small satellites things like radios, thrusters, gimbals, and deorbit mechanisms. And then uh, the other half of our work is doing research and development to create new capabilities for space. And the main focus of our work is uh, capabilities for in-space services. So things like robotic in-space assembly, in-space manufacturing, and servicing and refueling of spacecraft. And this is a theme that, you know, this has sort of been my the theme that I've been really focused on for the last probably year, year and a half or so is this, I'm sort of, I'm coming to this realization, like, like there's been this incredible revolution in, in new kinds of rocketry with everything that SpaceX is doing, that everything that, that Blue Origins, you know, is doing plus all of the other, you know, there's, it feels like we're in a complete revolution of space flight. But this feels to me like it's like more of a waypoint to what the future really is, which is on orbit assembly and and manufacturing. And that's where you 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 and your organization are really on, on the cutting edge of this. So so where are we along this this trajectory moving towards this future was there is a lot more of the work of space done in space. Um. Overall, what we're trying to do is help create a viable and hopefully robust and growing economy in space. You know, companies and, and other entities providing services to other customers in space. Uh, we do have a, a long way to go there before we have a, a, a viable self-sustaining economy in space, but we and the rest of the space community are starting to make some, some really good strides. One of the most significant advances over the past couple of weeks was uh, Northrop Grumman and, and their subsidiary uh, space services um, have, have performed the first commercial uh, docking of two spacecraft and they're starting to provide life sustainment services for a commercial uh, communication satellite in GEO. Um, so that's starting to demonstrate the, the technical feasibility and, and commercial viability of these in-space services. But, um, on, on, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, on, on our end, we're, we're in the R&D stage, but we're starting to do um, some in-space demonstrations of our technologies. Right now, we have a payload on the space station called a refabricator yeah. that is working to demonstrate in-space recycling and, and sustainable manufacturing capabilities. And right now, we're preparing a, another flight experiment called MakerSat that will fly on the Restore-L robotic servicing mission in 2023, I think it is. Um, and that will demonstrate in space manufacture of a very large uh, carbon fiber composite structure. And basically what we're trying to, we'll, what we'll be doing there is manufacturing uh, composite two by fours in space that in the future yeah. could be used to build big structures. And I mean, I think we featured a demonstration of your trussellator um, a, a while back. And, just, and, and I think this is the paradigm that 
you know, up until this point, when you look at, say, the James Webb Space Telescope, right, you've got this enormously complicated instrument that has many folding pieces, hundreds of actuators, everything has got to go perfectly correct. And to even get a telescope that's that big to fit within a launch fairing, not only it's got to be able to be constructed down on Earth, it's got to be able to handle Earth-based gravity, it's got to be able to handle the rigors of space, so it's got to unfold all perfectly, and it's all just got to happen. And nothing can go wrong out at the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, yeah. which is terrifying. Um, and yet, it doesn't work that way with anything else that we do, right? We don't, we don't take a warehouse and fold it up into the shipping container. And then when you, when it arrives at its final location, you press one button and the whole warehouse pops open perfectly. It gets built on site. And, and so this is, this is that next step in, in us being able to, to sort of build the kinds of larger structures that we want in space. Yeah, if we want to be able to build advanced exploration spacecraft for exploring the rest of the of the solar system, if we want to build habitats um, that are bigger than a habit trail um, and, and are comfortable for people to live in long term, uh, if we want to build the, the 30 meter scale telescopes that we need to be able to get um, images of and spectral data on exoplanets so we can see if there's alien life out there. Uh, if we want to do all those those next step things, we're going to need the capability to bring up, either bring up pieces or raw materials and assemble them, fashion them on orbit to make, you know, big high performance systems yeah. uh, for, for those kinds of missions. And Elon Musk has famously said that that really the cost of of a like in a fully reusable sense the cost of getting payloads into orbit is really just the cost of of the fuel for the rocket itself that could be as low as say half a million dollars to be able to get to space and isn't that paradigm sort of the same thing i mean obviously you're going to have you know you're not going to 3d print your circuit boards and sensitive electronics when you're out in space but but how much of the structure how much how much do you think of of the kinds of missions that we have coming in the future could actually be say assembled and manufactured in space and how much would have to be brought up uh i i think it'll be a process where we'll be able to manufacture more and more of it we're going to start out doing uh, manufacturing the components that uh particularly ones where performance scales with size where so you really want it to be big to get high performance out of it. Um, so things like large antennas, uh, large solar arrays, uh, those sorts of things will will make sense to to manufacture on orbit first. Um, so you know right now we're starting out with support structures like trusses and beams where um, you, you could fold it up and deploy it on orbit but, the process of manufacturing it and testing it so that it can fold up and fit into a launch vehicle and then unfold reliably and precisely on orbit is extremely expensive. Uh, so, you know, right now we're looking at manufacturing and assembling those parts on orbit. Um, so that'll be where we start out. But I think over time, as we get experience and, and learn more about the process and, and develop more advanced robotic systems, we can build and manufacture more of the systems on orbit. So uh, things like pressure vessels or habitats would be great to manufacture on orbit. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, electronics and, and those and more integrated types of components. In the near term, it'll probably make sense to manufacture those here on Earth because a lot of those highly integrated components, um, you, you need a lot of uh, infrastructure to be able to manufacture them, you know, big assembly machines and that sort of thing. And putting that stuff on orbit or, or in space is going to be very expensive um, and, and take a lot of time. So near term, it'll make sense to manufacture those uh, very compact, tightly integrated components on orbit. But I think eventually, um, we can develop the capabilities to make 
those those types of components on orbit. And I know that NASA is investing in some efforts looking at um, in space manufacture of circuit boards and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. it'll, again, it'll take a while to develop and mature those technologies, but I think eventually, you know, 15, 20 years from now, that'll be possible. How does, I mean, again, sort of our our understanding of what kinds of space missions are possible, what's possible in space, really just depends on being able to, like when you look at some of these telescopes, like the Herschel Space Telescope, it is the shape of a launch fairing. Um, yes. Same with the upcoming W first and so on, right? These spacecraft are just designed to be as big as you can jam into a launch fairing and then and then fly it. So if if trusses, right, various trusses are essentially free compared to, you know, you know, when they essentially just vats of of composite materials that are then spun out in space to whatever size and shape that you need. Does what are some advantages that this might give us in terms of space missions in terms of telescopes? And I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, could we make a telescope that's incredibly big, but less accurate? and still get the job done as opposed to something that's a lot more precise, but, but smaller, if, if I'm sort of, if that's making any sense. Yeah, you, you could make, well, you could make a telescope or support structure that's much larger than you could fit into a rocket right now. Um, for applications like telescopes, you still, you're still going to need precision somewhere, but um, you could, you can kind of localize the precision into smaller, more compact parts and build build the structure with less precision and then kind of adjust from it um, from there. So, you know, whereas the, the James Webb telescope, which unfolds, that unfolding process needs to occur with incredible precision. And then they do have some adjustability beyond that. But part of the reason it's um, behind, so behind schedule and so enormously beyond its original uh, budget is you know designing testing proving out a system that can fold up survive launch vibrations and then unfold precisely on orbit is incredibly challenging um, so we by doing some of that manufacturing and assembly on orbit i think we can greatly reduce the the overall cost of doing so and end up with much larger uh, higher resolution systems and I know that a couple of years ago, um, NASA funded your spider fab uh, mechanism <laughs> to, uh, technology. Can you give people a bit of a background on that and sort of what the state of that is today? Yeah, so spider fab uh, was funded by NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program to uh, look at um, developing an architecture for in space manufacture of large antennas, large telescopes, other, other large systems. Um, so the NIAC work funded our, our look at um, what parts of a space system it would make sense to make on orbit, uh, what parts it would make sense to build here on ground and then carry up and robotically assemble. And we started working on um, scoping out or planning a, a development of the, the component technologies necessary to to actually realize that vision. Um, so the in the past uh, seven or eight years since the NIAC effort wrapped up, uh, we, we've made pretty good progress on, on working towards that goal. It's been slower than, than I'd like, uh, but that's mainly been constrained by funding. Um, so we've got the MakerSat project that will go up in a couple of years to demonstrate in-space manufacture of precise uh, composite structures uh, with with low coefficient of thermal expansion, which is really important for um, being able to make a telescope support structure that that will perform the way it needs to for, for deep state space astronomy. Uh, we've been working on um, robotic tools such as our Kraken robotic arm, um, and um, right now, recently we've been working on integrating that into a uh, express rack payload for the space station, kind of a suitcase sized uh, payload that'll slide into a rack on the space station and then an arm will pop out of it and be able to manipulate experiments on the station. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a, that's a Canadian's 
job. You're not trying to take our jobs, are you? That's what that's what we've been. Well, well, actually, we're 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 running into politics of <laughs> robotics on the space station, where you know we, you know, Canada has certain parts of space robotics kind of locked down, and um, so we're we're trying to navigate through those politics <laughs> as as we navigate through the yeah. through the technical challenges. Yeah, we've never seen a, a vehicle that we thought had enough robotic arms. <laughs> I've actually uh, seen apparently some rovers that we're working on, uh, you know, and I'm just imagining some kind of spider with a bunch of arms. Um, yep. uh, so then, I mean, sort of cast your mind forward. I mean, this is sort of one piece of it. I mean, there's this idea of assembly. There's the idea of manufacturing. There are some pretty interesting ideas for being able to potentially generate power. I've seen some interesting like spray painted solar panel systems that maybe you could you could do those in space. Um, uh, and then the other idea that a lot of people are very interested in is just this idea of actually acquiring your resources itself from space in, just in situ resource acquisition. How do you sort of feel about that future as well? Uh, I'm very excited about it uh, as well. And as we've been uh, developing and testing the, our technologies for in-space manufacture, we're always thinking about um, how in the future those processes could take materials we could get in space and, and integrate them into the process. So for example, uh, with our trussellator, the, the composite manufacturing process, uh, right now we're working on a, a process where we'll launch um, carbon fiber composite feedstock from Earth but in the future, we'd very much like to use um, basalt fiber that can be manufactured from basalt materials you can get on the moon or asteroids. Uh, and although basalt is um, denser, heavier than carbon fiber, by volume, it can have about the same strength as carbon fiber. So it would be a fairly, fairly readily uh, dropped in replacement for the, the Earth-based carbon fiber materials. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And we're, you know, one of the, what I, I, I think one of the first near-term uh, in situ resources that that we can utilize is the space debris that's in orbit around the Earth. Uh, there's, you know, several billion dollars worth of materials already in orbit around Earth if if you go by the, the launch cost. Um, and so the past few years, we've been working under a some funding from DARPA under their small business program to develop a process for uh, basically chewing up and recycling metal part metal parts of rocket systems um, and and refabricating those to make segments for a big antenna reflector. That's a project called Orb Weaver. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're looking at a variety of different avenues of doing in-space manufacturing and assembly. And we're always, always thinking about how we can take stuff that we can get in space and, you know, take space trash and transform it right. into something of value. I get that question all the time from, from my viewers, which is just like, yeah, couldn't we take all of this space junk that's already up there and use it for some other purpose. People want to know why we can't take the international space station and send it to the moon at the end of its, at the end of its mission. And I always describe this as a problem just of energy that, that it's one thing to have the metal and plastic and, and volatiles and whatever is on that thing. It's just that it's moving 28,000 kilometers per hour in some non ideal direction for what you may want to use it for. So how do you how do you envision being able to actually use some of this stuff that's already up there for some for you know, to to uh, use it for some other purpose? Yeah, you're right. The huge challenge is that all these satellites and objects are in different orbits. So they're, you know, moving at 14 kilometers a second relative to each other. Um, but, but there are a few places you can go where there's pretty high density of objects that you could collect with relatively minor, um, budgets for the, the propulsion. Um, one of the obvious ones is, uh, geostationary orbit and the graveyard orbit, which is up above geostationary orbit. Um, those are all in the same inclination or roughly, 
and you can move around between them for fairly small small amounts of propellant. Um, another really good place to go is uh, sun synchronous orbit in low Earth orbit, um, where you know qu quite a lot of satellites and, and rocket bodies have been launched into sun sync orbit. Um, you will need to use some propellant to move between the altitudes and move between the different inclinations that are sun synchronous. Um, but if you plan your path carefully and can take some time, you could actually move between many, many different objects, collect them or otherwise repurpose them um, and collect a lot of material for fairly reasonable amount of propulsion. Um, I want to come back and talk about about some of these ideas. And I know some of the viewers have a bunch of questions as well. But I'd like to shift into just the space junk conversation as well. Because that's the that's the thing that you've been working on. That's probably more recent in people's memory specifically, you have a tether back to your name attached yeah. to a spacecraft that is helping to bring it back down to uh, to Earth. So can you talk about this this project? Yeah, well, it took us 25 years to, from when we started developing those technologies yeah. to finally getting it demonstrated. Um, but about about 10 years ago, a little little over 10 years ago, we started developing uh, a a end of life deorbit device for satellites. And our objective, my objective, in it was to try and come up with the simplest, stupidest, cheapest uh, end of life deorbit solution. Because early on in our existence and early on in our career, we spent a lot of time trying to develop and market a, a very capable uh, end of life deorbit solution that we call the Terminator Tether. Um, and we sold absolutely zero of them because back at that time, nobody had a requirement to do deorbit. So they didn't want to pay for it. And then our solution was, that solution was kind of on the expensive side. Terminator tape, again, is is really kind of almost as simple as a brick. It's basically a box with some conductive tape folded up in it and a release mechanism. And so when it's time to, when the satellite's done with its mission, it's time to deorbit the satellite. The satellite activates the release mechanism, the cover pops off the device and pulls out the tape. And then from there, it's just a passive, very completely passive device that interacts with the space environment to create additional drag and pull the satellite down out of orbit. Um, we have four of them on orbit right now. Two of them were little tiny ones that were that are on the uh, AeroCube 5 satellites launched by the, the Aerospace Corporation. The other two are bigger units called Nanosat Terminator tapes um, that are on a couple of uh, university student built satellites, Prox-1, and uh, NPSAT, the, the unit on the uh, Prox-1 satellite was activated back in beginning of September. And by looking at the, um, the, the orbital, orbital elements of it as measured by the space tracking systems, we can see that the, the tape has deployed and it's working. You know, so the satellites cruise along and then all of a sudden it starts uh, descending much more rapidly. It's still descending slowly, but much more rapidly than it normally would. Um, so we can tell that that tape has, has deployed and it's working. So we've, we finally got a, a yeah. deorbit tether or deorbit tape on orbit and demonstrated. And so what do you think for these smaller CubeSats, what do you think is, I mean, it always depends on the actual altitude that they're flying at, but say, I don't know, let's imagine that somebody launched, say a whole bunch, like, 42,000 um, low Earth orbiting communication satellites um, at, say, 550 kilometers. Um, how long would a thing like that tend to degrade? And then how much of a change could could something like this work? And then does it make more sense, you know, on the higher ones? Perhaps there's another one that's maybe running its satellites at, say, I don't know, like 1,100 kilometers or something. So the 550 kilometers altitude is actually a pretty good one for, or as far as things, these things go, it's a pretty good one for a big constellation like that because um, at that altitude, there's a fair amount of drag from the upper parts of the atmosphere. So those objects, if they're not doing any propulsive uh, maintenance of the orbit, those satellites will come down 
you know, roughly within a solar cycle. So, you know, 10 to 12 years at least, maybe faster, depending upon how big they are, or how heavy they are, that sort of thing. So um, objects that are below roughly 650 kilometers will naturally deorbit within about 20, within 25 years. Uh, where you really have to worry about end of life uh, disposal of the satellite is above 650 kilometers. And so, you know, a lot, lot of things, a lot of uh, satellites go up to say sun synchronous orbit at 700 kilometers or 800 kilometers. And that, that's where you really need to um, have additional capability to make sure the satellite deorbits in a timely manner. And like, just to give people some context, like how long would they be looking at for some of these? Like, if you are operating at 800 kilometers or 900 kilometers, or like I said, the one web, I think they're at, they're at 1100, I 1100 think. 1100 or 1200. Yeah. Like how long are you looking at for say a one web to come back down to earth? Never. Uh, it, 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 once you get up above 650 kilometers, the orbital lifetime kind of goes up exponentially. So at 750 to 800 kilometers, the it's going to be up there for 100 or a few hundred years. You get up to you know 1,000, 1,100 kilometers, those objects are going to be up there for 1,000 years or more. Yeah. So you know, and and much above that, it, you right. know, it goes up even longer. And so then, what is the impact then of the tether on on which of those orbits do you think that you're going to see? a useful degrade degradation of their orbit. So the the terminator tape is it's a very simple and passive device. Um, it will be useful for systems that are or most useful for systems that are say between 550 kilometers and up to about 1000 kilometers. Um, and the the size of the size and mass of the satellite that the tape um, is, is capable of bringing down within 25 years, um, you know, will depend upon the altitude and the, the mass and the configuration of the satellite and, and depend upon how big the, the tape is. Uh, the nice thing about that solution is it's very readily scalable. Um, so we can make a bigger tape, longer tape fairly easily without significantly changing the design. We just need to scale the system up and then put it through the battery of tests again. Um, I've got a question from uh, from the audience here. Does it scale up for bigger satellites? I mean, you say that the actual technology scales up, but like if you're building a James Webb sized object, is there some limit to the mass of the satellite that you can that this will work on? Do you think? Um, yes and no. I mean, th there's no um, fundamental limit, but to bring something, to bring down something the size of the James Webb Telescope, you know, m many metric tons, you'd need a, a huge, huge tape to bring that down within 25 years. I mean, you'd need a huge solar sail or, or anything uh, else you try try to use. Right. Um, and if we tried to do that, other users of space would probably object to having such a large uh, drag area in orbit near them. So with our terminator tapes, we, we actually try to, we, when we design them, we, we keep the length of the tape as short as possible, typically under 100 meters, so that uh, they won't pose a significant concern with regards to collisions with other objects. Um, now, if you wanted to bring down a big satellite like a James Webb, you know, multi-ton uh, upper stage or, or satellite, there are other there are ways of enhancing the performance of the the tape or using an electrodynamic tether, um, but those those solutions aren't aren't yet proven on orbit. We're still working on those. Right. Um, so I mean, what is the state of of planning for the end of life right now? I mean, we've got this increasing concern. Less so for the low Earth orbiting ones, as you mentioned. I've never heard anyone talk about it in terms of a solar cycle. Like you're talking about that that 11 year cycle for the sun to to swap its magnetic field. That's really cool, actually. Um, yeah, as, a, the, as a time the frame, it kind of swells every 11 yeah. years, and then so it'll it'll reach out, and satellites that are you know at that 600 650 kilometer altitude will will for 
a few years experience much higher drag and that'll that'll bring them in but as we get more spacecraft flying as impacts happen of course the potential of some increasing cascade of of impacts goes up and eventually certain orbits become very uh unpleasant for whatever is put there um right now are there any plans like is, is anyone taking any kind of action to make sure that their their satellites have any kind of end of life mechanism so um the the agencies government organizations that uh regulate aspects of space flight such as the fcc faa uh, you know, NASA, DOD, and the inter and ESA and other international organizations um, have generally agreed on a plan for how to address it, and they have uh, they have been imposing guidelines and and more recently requirements uh, that new satellites and new systems that go up into orbit um, have some means of ensuring that they will just properly dispose themselves within 25 years. Um, so there are steps being made to, to address the problem. However, you know, um, there, there isn't really, aren't it really any teeth to those regulations? Um, and a lot of programs still get waivers on them. If it's going to be too hard for them to, to meet that requirement, they, you know, go and pull some strings and get a waiver. Um, I, we see some motion to, to tighten up those, those requirements, um, and, and, you know, we hope those will come into play. Um, and, you know, so I, I think over the next five to 10 years, you'll see more, uh, more significant requirements requiring faster disposal, um, and perhaps putting some enforcement teeth behind, behind those requirements. Uh, flip side, we, we, you do see the, the commercial entities who are, you know, putting up dozens or hundreds or thousands of satellites are taking some steps to address that. You know, uh, SpaceX is designing their systems to deorbit themselves at the end of life. Uh, other other you know, OneWeb and uh, other organizations putting up uh, satellites are taking similar measures to, to make sure that they can kind of clean up their orbits after after the satellite has done their mission. Um, however, right now, most of those organizations are relying upon the, the thrusters or propulsion that the satellite carries, um, which works great if the satellite is operating. Yeah. Launch the satellite and it's DOA or, you know, it's operating for a few years and then it's, one of its wheels freezes or, you know, otherwise you lose it. Um, then the, the reliance on the thruster to do deorbit um, isn't a great plan. Uh, so we are we're trying to encourage them to adopt a you know at least a backup simple solution like the Terminator tape to provide some assurance that at end of life you know if the thing dies it, it'll still come down. What is the scope of the problem right now? Like like there are I know tens of thousands of pieces of debris of varying sizes and satelliteness up there. Um, how, if we were serious and not like tried to completely clear up space entirely, but, but just tried to, to make the existing environment a little safer and a little more manageable and then bake in proper deorbiting techniques on all of the new spacecraft that that go up how big of a problem are we facing to try to to try to rein this in to what we've already done uh well studies that that nasa and aerospace corp and, and other folks have done indicate that um we could get the the growth of the space debris population under control by having a program that would go up and remove five large high-risk objects per year. Uh, so it would go up and clean up, you know, the, the, the main problem is there are clusters of, you know, dead rocket bodies and other large thing, large objects that are in orbits that pass through a lot of other satellites' orbits. And so there, there's a cluster of objects that are very high-risk for 
having collisions and creating more debris. Uh, if we went up and, and re actively removed those, we could keep the growth of the space debris population under control. And now that's not reducing it, but it's keeping it from going up, you know, explosively, keep it, keep it at a kind of moderate growth rate. Um, so, you know, it, it is possible to do it. Um, and, you know, there are several other countries, Japan, uh, ESA, uh, particularly Germany, um, are actively investing in um, demonstrations of capabilities to be able to go and do that. It's a little, fr you know, it's frustrating to me uh, that the U.S. is just kind of sitting back and not not actively pursuing that to any degree. Um, but ho hopefully somebody will. Yeah, I mean, when you think about, I mean, even today, right? That you might require a sixty million dollar Falcon launch with some custom built satellite that's cost you maybe. I don't know, maybe you mass produce them, you're looking at a couple of hundred million dollars, maybe a hundred million dollars, 50 million, you know, to make you're looking at a couple of hundred million dollars per piece of junk. Maybe yeah. you can batch a couple together, maybe you got a few that are on a similar orbit, and you can have something go and grab a bunch at the same time and then send them all to their doom. But it is still just a an enormous expense to try to fix a problem that like, you know, who knows what's really going to happen, right? The future's uncertain. We got coronavirus. Well, so, I think and, it's part of the, part of the challenge is everyone assumes that it's a enormous expense. Yeah. Um, but you know, the work that we've been doing with the Terminator tape and, and some of the robotics approaches, I, I really do believe that there are affordable ways of making a significant dent in the, debris population. And with that project that I mentioned earlier, the orb weaver project, where instead of getting rid of the space debris, we want to collect it and turn it into something of value. Uh, what we're trying to do there is get to a, get to be able to uh, actually make a profit by cleaning up space debris. So with that, we're trying to do kind of an end around the, yeah. the, the space debris problem by turning it into an opportunity to, for, us or hopefully somebody to make some money. Well, what would you turn? I mean, what a value would you would you want to turn it into? Uh, one of the things I we'd most likely do is is use the material to make very large antennas for satellite communications. Um, and variety of, variety of different uses for that, but uh, large antennas. You know, right right now. Uh, communication satellites tend to use very large antennas that have to be designed to fold up and fit inside a rocket. So they're, uh, they're very expensive. Uh, if instead we could get essentially free material on orbit and make those big antennas on orbit, we could reduce the cost of them and potentially provide higher performance. But I'm just sort of imagining the kinds of technologies that might be required, right? To digest a dead communication satellite or a, or a spent upper booster stage, right? I mean, all the parts, all of the different laminated layers and, and pieces, like what are the parts that would be most valuable to extract from, from something like that? Well, right now we're taking kind of baby steps. Yeah. And yeah. But um, you know, your imagination, come on, you've a got a process that could take, um, aluminum parts on, on a rocket in, in particular, we're, uh, we're developing a process to take what's called an ESPA ring, which is a big aluminum ring that goes in between the rocket and the, the big satellite on the rocket. And then you can put a bunch of secondary small sats or other payloads on the ESPA ring. Uh, but that, that ring is a big chunk of aluminum uh, that is, is pretty well suited to being chewed up and melted down and turned into something else. I love, I, I do love this idea. Um, uh, Arjon asks in the chat, what is the largest thing that you could construct in space with your methods? So, you know, you're in microgravity. What are the limits to what is possible to build with something like spider fab? Uh, there's really no limit. I mean, we have, we have done analyses of manufacturing kilometer scale antennas uh, on orbit. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you have, one or a few robots and you can wait a couple months 
it, it's possible to do that and the, the mass requirements and power requirements and uh, launch mass requirements are all are all all can be pretty reasonable. I mean, that's the part that, you know, as I was working on some of the research that I was doing, that was the part that was always so incredible to me was just that, that when you send up the material in, you know, a bucket of, of ground up aluminum powder, that's then brought into a 3D printing machine or, you know, composite materials or, or things like that. It's actually very compact and can be formed, fashioned into enormous structures. Yep at reasonable expenses. So, I mean, just, can you give people sort of just a sense of scale of like how much raw material turns into how much enormous space-based radio telescope? Uh, so a while ago, back in the, the uh, SpiderFab project, we did an analysis if, um, if we could take up a uh, ESPA, uh, ESPA payload volume, which is about the size of a half height filing cabinet. Um, if we could take up that much raw material, the spider fab process could turn that into a truss that would be seven kilometers long. <laughs> right. Now you could have one truss that was seven kilometers long, or maybe a cross truss that was three and a half kilometers long, or, you know, some kind of space based or a hoop that's a kilometer across. Yeah. Yeah. And so you could build something that was, of significant scale. And yet you could fit, I mean, again, half sized filing cabinet. So it's like something you could pick up. Yep. And when you look at, say, I don't know if you saw the, the fairing, the launch fairing of the new blue origin, it's like, you know, seven meter fairing. It's a, yeah. it's a, you know, it's as big as a, you know, big as a warehouse. You just think about how much building material could be sent up in, in one of those. What kind of time scales do you think to, to go from, you know, your, your robot and its raw materials is up there in space and it's ready to go to, to actually being able to, to extrude all of the, the parts that it requires and, and assemble them. You mean the, the time scale for a mission? Yeah. So like from when the thing gets to space to when it, you know, it says jobs done, I built it. Uh, well, again, that'll depend. It'll depend on a number of factors, but, uh, when we looked at that kilometer scale antenna, uh, it looked like a, a single robot with reasonable power assumptions uh, could do, could build that in a couple of months. You know, yeah. Robot, robots work 24-7. Yeah. You, you know, as long as the sun is shining. Robot. So, yeah, it just, just keeps operating and can make, make a very large structure over time. So as we as we start to push towards being more and more of a solar system spanning civilization. I mean, we're staking these first just initial steps. What do you think are going to be the accomplishments that will be easier than we expect? Like, what are the things that you're kind of surprised are ideas that aren't being adopted and accepted and, and sort of embraced as quickly as they should be? I mean, it feels like you've focused your whole company in this direction, but I'd love to hear what you think is, you know, people just have some blind spot that they could, they could and should be working on? Uh, well, well, I think that in-space assembly of, of modular space systems is going to um, provide a pretty dramatic improvement in the reliability and cost of space systems. Uh, right now, if you want to put up a, a communication satellite in geosynchronous orbit, those satellites are, they have, because they're so big and so expensive, they have to be designed to work for 15 years. So they have to be built with uh, several layers of redundancy. That's why they're so big and that's why they're so expensive. And that's why they have to operate for 15 or 20 years just to pay back the investment in them. Um, we're exploring a different approach where instead you build these big systems by putting up a number of small uh, low cost components, which don't need to have all that redundancy in them. So they can be like little small satellites uh, fairly produced at low cost, but by using a robot to basically click them together on orbit and designing them properly, you can get them to cooperate together and share resources. So, uh, 
So at the system level, it can have high, very high redundancy. And by having a number of them together, they can provide uh, high performance associated with the big expensive systems. Um, so we're working towards initial demonstrations of those kind of architectures. And, and our, our hope is that you know, we, can, we can do a demo and, and show the space community the advantages of this approach. Um, and then I think you'll see a radical transformation of how we build and deploy and operate and maintain um, you know, high performance space systems. Yeah, there was, there was a very interesting proposal that came out uh, a couple of months ago just about suggesting that the time is now for an in-based a space-based assembly of whatever the next generation telescope is going to be, whether it's LUVAR or I'm not sure if you actually worked on that on that uh, on that proposal, but and and that you could build a say 12 meter, 15 meter telescope, send it up in in parts, assemble it in orbit, just like the International Space Station. I mean, and mirror before it, like this this work has been done before, and that. And that many paradigms change when you don't have to really worry about how to make the thing fold and how the thing come together. And if yep. one part is broken, you just throw it overboard and wait for the next, wait for the replacement part to show up, and then your robotic arm, you know, attaches attaches to it. So, as the counter to to the um, to the question that I asked you before, how has science fiction rotted our brains? How, you know, there are things that that we think are harder, but actually may turn out to be a lot easier. But what are the things that we think is going to be easy, but you suspect is going to be a very difficult problem to solve? Oh, boy. Well, um, the, the, you know, as, as we've gotten into it and, and started flying experiments, you know, we found that there are a lot of little things that um, that can reach up and bite you. Uh, material behavior in space, um, in the temperature extremes and in vacuum, um, can be very different than than the way it behaves here in the laboratory. Um, so we found that you know processing temperatures for materials can be very different in space than than they are in the ground. Um, so you know that's just one example where there's a lot lot of little details, and you know to get a robotic system to successfully build something on orbit, you need to work out and prove out and demonstrate all those little details. Uh, so materials can bite you, you know, the reliability of components, you know, if you're gonna have a robotic system that builds an enormous antenna or habitat or, or whatever, that robotic system has to be very reliable or it needs to be able to, you know, heal itself or repair itself, you know, as it goes. And, you know, do you put the money into, put invest the money into reliability or do you invest it into an architecture that can fix itself? You know, there, there are a lot of different ways you can go there. Um, but I mean, you're starting to work your way towards this idea of almost von Neumann probes, right? This idea of self-replicating spacecraft that are operating in, in space itself. And of course, that starts to make you wonder, you know, the brings you back to the Fermi paradox, where, where are all the aliens, where are all the self-replicating robot probes around? If you had to cast your mind forward, how long do you think until we've got the ability to build a robot that can make a copy of itself out of the, the resources of the solar system? Uh, I, I would say, you know, realistically, that's probably 100, 200 years from now. Uh, maybe longer, given the, the pace of how slow it is to get new technology funded and developed in space. Um, but you know, it, I think eventually it'll be feasible. Yeah, it it seems, and and again, sort of back to what I was originally saying, like that all of these moguls are focusing on their rocket systems, and it in it and it's just this theme that just keeps coming back to me is that that this is a blip, this is a temporary step where suddenly it was all the rage to launch things from the ground into space. And then and then eventually it makes more sense to extract all of your resources from space, turn them into other things in space. And then the only need for rockets is going to be, I guess, the people, you know, to send me, send the meat <laughs> from the surface of the Earth to space. And then the number of rocket launches will actually 
decrease at some point. So, you know, it makes sense to be, uh, you know, the CEO of an in-space manufacturing company. I'm just saying. It just seems like a thing. Um, what do you think about, about some, like, of the possible places to acquire resources in space? You know, people argue about whether you want to go to the moon, try to bring stuff up from there, whether asteroids make more sense, comets. You're talking about dismantling other satellites. Um, what do you think would be, will be the, the first places that we'll be able to start using resources in space to build things at a, at a large scale? I think probably the moon, but you know all, all of the above are are feasible to one one degree or another. But um, <clears throat> you know there's water resources, there's plenty of mineral and metal resources on the moon, so I think there's a lot we could do there. Um, challenge with the moon is there's not much nitrogen, so you got to go somewhere else to get that. It's I mean that's the same problem with with Mars as well is. You know, there are there are certain things that we become very accustomed to here on Earth, like breathing, you know, <laughs> walking outside and breathing things that are that are just not there and ready to go for us. But also just um, certain resources and certain chemicals are going to be notoriously difficult for us to use to be able to live the kind of life that we're that we're hoping to do so. What are some things that you think that maybe future explorers are going to be chronically short of? They're going to be requiring care packages from from Earth. Well, like I said, it you know lunar systems on the moon um, are you know to sustain people long term. They're probably going to get need to have care packages of nitrogen or nitrogen fertilizer sent from Earth or or somewhere else. Um, asteroids, you know you. A lot of the elements you need to support life and industry are available on the asteroid, asteroids, but you're going to have to visit a whole bunch of different asteroids to go shopping for the various compo components that you're going to need. You know, different some asteroids have a lot of metals, some of them have a lot of volatiles. Um, so you'll, you'll have to do a lot of, a lot of shopping um, in different orbits. Um, so th those are the things that come yeah. to mind immediately. Um, running a business, running a space, uh, I guess running a business that uh, depends on future profitability of space is notoriously difficult. There's another um, Seattle based company that went through some difficulties recently. Um, I think they're a Luxembourg company now. Um, there are and there, there are others as well. And, you know, a lot of people want to get into it. You know, I think we're all very passionate about what the future of human space exploration is going to be, but it is actually very difficult. So do you, do you have any tips for someone who has been running a company for quite a while? And, and I know you guys went through a hard time with the government shutdown last year. Um, do you have any recommendations for people who want to get into this field, who want to make a career in, in helping in this process? Well, yeah. So, um, Tragically, I didn't start out as a billionaire. Yeah. So, you know, right. We, we did too. <clears throat> yeah. Apart from that, is your number one suggestion is start out as a billionaire. <laughs> Lacking that, you know, we've had to focus on, um, uh, you know, as we've been trying to develop our long-term goals, we've been we've found kind of uh, small steps towards the way, and we focused on trying to develop products that we can sell based upon those technologies. Uh, so that means we have to start out looking at the, looking at the market, seeing where the, the needs and opportunities are and, you know, figuring out kind of a, a, a reasonable stepwise path towards getting towards the long-term goal. Um, so that, that's part of why, you know, um, uh, 15 years ago, we started uh, developing component technologies for small satellites. And, and fortunately, we, we did that at a pretty good time. So as the small sat industry has kind of exploded over the past five years, we've, we've been able to take advantage of that and get some of those, those technologies into production and on orbit and get some profits out of them. Um, so, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta focus on what the market needs now and figure out how to find the union between what the market needs now and what you want to be developing in the future. And, and 
for people who want to go into this field, um, any recommendations on on education, on on things they can do to make them, you know, to find employment? Uh, well, so the, the, one of the things that's really surprised me uh, about the space industry, or you know, in terms of who we we as a company hire, um, we do hire, you know, we hire aerospace engineers, but we hire a lot of electrical engineers, we hire a lot of mechanical engineers, we hired uh, materials engineers, software engineers. So um, you don't necessarily have to go into aerospace engineering to have a career working in the space industry. Um, you know, to, to do full aerospace systems, you need all these different um, skill sets and, and capabilities. Um, we even got a few physicists. Um, but, you know, to, to maximize your chance of, be, of finding employment in the space industry, you know, when you're in school, you really want to get your hands dirty working on, uh, you know, hardware projects or software projects, something concrete to show potential employers that, you know, you've actually got skills, you actually, you know, can figure out a, a plan for getting something done and execute it on it and deliver some, some product at the end of the, of the project, whether it's software or hardware or, or whatever. Um, just show that you're, you know, a go-getter and, and you've got the passion for working in space. Uh, and th that, I think, is the most important thing. Uh, I got one final question here from uh, Michael Mayer, which is, could Tethers Unlimited link two starships so that they could spin around each other to make artificial gravity? Yeah, of course. Uh, that use of tethers for generating artificial gravity is is definitely a good, good way to go. You can get really long lengths for the, the rotation so you don't have uh, astronauts getting dizzy from Cor Coriolis forces. So yeah, that's definitely a possibility. And you see them being able to handle the forces of all of that mass spinning around oh, yeah. and around. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. So if people want to keep track of what, uh, what Tethers Unlimited is working on, uh, where should they go and what should they be keeping an eye out for? Uh, well, they can look at our website, www.tethers.com. They can look at our Facebook page, Tethers Un Unlimited. Uh, those are those are probably the two best places. Uh, we post post a fair amount of stuff on on Facebook as well as LinkedIn. Um, I, I don't Twitter, so I, I I don't bother with Twitter. It's probably best. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, Rob, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. It was great to hear sort of directly what you're working on and someone to tackle all of my uh, future space manufacturing and assembly questions. Because like I said, this has just been my theme for the last probably year and a half. I'm just I'm noticing all of the interesting projects that are that are coming up. So I do appreciate you taking the time to to chat with us today. And uh, and good luck with with all of the the projects that, that come on next. I, I really hope you clean up the space junk. Okay, thanks. It was great talking with you. All right. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. everyone, today for watching. And um, we will be back later on this week with a special episode with, with Jim Al-Khalili with The World According to Physics. That's going to be on, on Thursday at like 1130. So just check the calendar. It's a funny time, but that's because he's in Britain and will. Um, uh, I didn't want to have him show up at 5 p.m. to be able to do the do the show with me. Um, so uh, make sure you put that in your calendar. And then we've got uh, next Monday, uh, I think Susanna Kohler is here. And then we've got Ryan Watkins later on in the week, another funny time. And then Phil Metzger has put himself back in the calendar for the week after that. So uh, stay tuned for all of the upcoming events. So thank you everyone for watching. Thanks for the moderators for firing those questions. Sorry to get a chance to get to too many of them. I was, uh, it was all about me this week. Um, and uh, lots of good stuff coming your way over the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. Thanks, everybody.